of Education at the Northern Virginia Business Referral Roundtable. He's dedicated to providing others with the professional attention necessary to help them develop their talent and achieve their highest potential. He's an experienced author, lecturer, business coach, and financial pro professional with more than 25 years experience throughout the DC metro area and elsewhere. His team works together to develop powerful products and services for professional and personal development, including Vision Quest 90, Coffee, Tea, You and Me, and a new book, The Power Playbook. You might tell us more about that. His personal motto is that good life is spent in the service of others. He is, uh, his organization, Coach Powell Training and Development, helps business leaders learn and apply the latest and most effective leadership techniques. He's also, now I didn't know, I think I knew this, but I didn't remember. So don't ask, don't challenge him to racquetball. <laughs> I want to learn more about that later on. He also worked closely with small business owners to help them on coaching, counseling, and advocacy. I could go on and on, but we're here to hear it Martin. So thank you very much. So I have a tradition when I talk to anybody. And uh, I first have to start out by cleaning up a few positions. First of all, let's talk about this thing right here. How many of you have one? Good. I want you to take it out and turn that sucker on. <laughs> and I want you to text me. I'm going to give you my number. 703. 201 That's 703. 201-4267. Now, I want you to do something else. Turn that camera. You might not know how to take a selfie in the room. You're not, you're not, that's all right. We'll help you out with that. Turn your camera around. Take a photograph of yourself. And text it to me. I love it. <laughs> Here's why. For each one of you, I get a photograph and a text message from you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to contact you and I'm going to share with you the five elements of perfect presentation. It's everything you want to know to give a pitch perfect elevator speech whenever someone asks you, what is it that you do? Whenever you find an opportunity to share who you are, you know how to present yourself excellently. I'm going to give that to you. I'm also going to invite you to an absolutely free workshop on how to deliver that perfect elevator speech. It's going to be online probably a Saturday or Sunday morning or whatever. That's why I need your information so I can remember to put you on the list. I haven't decided to set a date yet, but you'll get the document way before the training starts. Fair enough? Because I want you to know, I want you, I want you to be mad that I didn't give you anything. Because I'm giving it to you right now. That's it. You don't get anything else. Okay, so while you're working on that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a graduate of Kent State University. Um, I, I spent some time out in lovely Ohio, the heart of it all, the Buckeye State. And that's right, that's right. And um, I went there in search of myself because I thought I wanted to be an architect like Mike Brady. Um, and he was the famous architect of my time. And so I watched the Brady Bunch. Anybody want to watch the Brady Bunch? And I fell in love with Mike Brady. I wanted everything Mike Brady had, including the three little girls and the three little boys and, and, the, and the band with the, 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 the we had the, um, the paneled station wagon. Yeah, I wanted that. And I wanted to be an architect because Mike Brady was an architect. I got to the university and I figured out after all four years into a five year program, I don't want to be I discovered some things about myself. I kind of like people. And I kind of like sharing with people. I kind of like talking to people. And architecture to me at that time was a lonely sport. How did I know? I knew because I was one of the few people during the early 90s and 80s to the late 80s to get internships working at we're licensed professional architects right here in the Washington Metropolitan Area. I did that because I know and I learned how to network. I learned how to get out there. I learned how to shake hands. I learned how to introduce myself. I learned how to make valuable, meaningful connections. 
And those valuable meaningful connections showed me what to do in the world of architecture and what not to do. And I realized I did not want to do this. So I'm four years into a five-year program. How does one explain to one's parents <laughs> that one's decided to change their major? So in this lovely time of mine, I decided, you know what? I'm going to pick up a major that at least I can explain to my parents. So I picked up an economics major, but it wasn't my love. It just happened to be something I could get done and, and be OK with it. But I also love sociology, and I love Pan-African studies. So I picked up all three majors. It took me two more years. And I finally was uh, allowed to, or regurgitated from, uh, Kent State University <laughs> with uh, three degrees. And that's pretty much all I had. I spent some time in New York City as a financial advisor, um, got married, came down here, decided we didn't want to have a kid in New York City. So when my lovely daughter was, was, was being incubated, uh, we decided we got to get out of New York and come back closer to home. Now, this is home base for us, not just because I kind of grew up around here, but um, if, if I have any in military brats in the area, this. D.C. is like you come back to D.C. every three years. So my father was a Navy man, and he brought me home to D.C. Like every two or three years, we always back to D.C., back to D.C., back to D.C. So I was born in Pax River, Maryland, uh, at the Patuxent Naval Air Station. Top Gun. Mm -hmm. Top Gun. That bell, I like that bell. <laughs> it means something to me. So um, we're not washing out, by the way. We're, we're, we're moving in. It's a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I learned throughout my life as a Navy brat, people are important. Friends are important. Because I had to change my friends every two or three years <laughs> as I was growing up. Whether we were moving to a rural area or urban area or anywhere in between, we had to figure out how to make it happen and how to make it work. It was just me and my mom because my father was shipping off to some other spot. So I learned the value of people. And I learned how to connect to people. I learned how to relate to people. And it saved my, you know what, on many occasions. So now, I have the lovely opportunity to teach people how to make valuable connections. How to create relationships that you're going to need for your future. How many of you all wish that you had kept up with some of the people in your past? These people, had you kept up with them, could be delivering to you now some incredible awful opportunities. I try to teach, especially young people, not to allow what's happened to all of us to happen to them. To make sure they understand the value of relationships with professors, the value of relationships with um, former bosses or bosses, the value of relationships with people who are three levels above them in any organization that they need, to, they need to get into. So they can make sure that they have the network that they need to have for their life. Because we're all born into a network, right? We're born into a family. We're born into some relationships. We're born into some extended relationships because of our parents. And then as we move on, we bump into some new things. Sometimes things of our choosing, sometimes people that are not so much of our choosing. But those are the networks we, we largely have. I'm here to let you know that the person you want to become in your future has to have a different network than the ones you were born into and the ones you bumped into along the way. Your new network has to be one that you've established on purpose, with intention with all of the tools and strategies that you've learned thus far in order to create it. Now, if you haven't learned these tools of how to make people fall in love with you because you've said so, the tools of how to recruit people into your world and leverage what they have to offer you, whether it's their time, their talent, or their treasure. If you haven't learned how to not just make people fall in love with you, but keep them in love with you. Long enough to create some opportunities, long enough to do some things that are gonna be meaningful to their lives. You probably should listen to some of the things I'm gonna teach you today. Because these are the gifts of life that we're not taught anywhere. We're not taught how to establish professional relationships. 
In fact, what we're taught mostly in professional relationships is there's a hierarchy. That means these people are up here and we are down here. And we don't deserve to even communicate with these people up here until we've done something we have to do or to earn our way, blah, blah, blah. Anybody subscribe to that theory, by the way? It's something that we're kind of taught. But is it real that people are so different that we shouldn't talk to them? <clears throat> we shouldn't communicate with them? We don't have anything to live. Is that real? I don't think so. In fact, by way of introduction, I believe that all of us are put here for a reason, for a purpose. We have gifts, we have talents, we have abilities that is our responsibility to share with others. I don't know if any, any of you who are Christians, but there's a parable in the Bible, in the book of Matthew. I think it's in a couple other books too. But it's the parable of the talents. You ever heard that parable before? Here's how it works in, in, in short order. A servant was left responsibility for a sum of money, which they call talents at that time. And the servant's responsibility was to do something with the talents. In fact, there was three servants, and they each were left with a portion of talent money according to their ability. They left enough according to their abilities. Everybody had the talents they had with the abilities they had, and it was an expectation that when the master returned, that they would have done something with the talent. Now, one of them decided, you know what? I'm kind of scared. I'm kind of afraid. I know the master is harsh. The master is stern. I don't want to take a risk and lose this ability, this talent I have. So I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to hide it. And so when the master comes back, I can then share it with him. And say, see, I won. I didn't lose anything. Good. What do you think happened to that person? Not so good. No, not so good. In fact, what happened to that person is the master said, you wicked and slothful servant. May you be cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that thought process resonates in my brain. <laughs> May you be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you don't do what you should do with the talents and the abilities that you've been left here with. That's a parable for life there, isn't it? Because the other two were able to take their talent and invest it. And make more from it. And get more from it. And he said to the one that did the best with their talents, he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been a steward over a little, and now I will give you many. Take from the wicked and slothful servant and give it to the one who's been faithful. So think about that. Where are we with our talent, with our gifts, with our abilities? Are we using them? to the best of our ability, right now, today. My, my life is built around helping people understand that they do have gifts, and they do have talents, and that they can use them right now to do what they need to do. I typically work with entrepreneurs, because they kind of already aware, they think they have something already to share. But it doesn't mean the rules or anything I'm gonna teach you guys today doesn't work for you. So I'm going to yammer on about some things I think is important for you to know. And I want you to engage. I want you to ask questions. I want you to think about some of the things that we're going to share with you. Because I'm going to talk to you today about some things I've created, some tools I've created that can help you kind of open up yourself to your talent, but also help you figure out where to go with it so that you can use it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about optimism and how it works. I'm going to talk to you a little about how the structure of optimism is something that you can use 
And I'm also going to talk to you about the dangers of being overly optimistic and the dangers of being pessimistic. And you may think, well, this is all common sense, Mark. But I've learned in, in my few years, my, my 52 short years, that um, common sense ain't so common sometimes. And we need to give ourselves the gift of discussion and discourse in order to know what we're thinking is really what we're thinking, what we should be thinking. <coughs> and that's what community is all about. It helps us to make sure that we're on the right path to what we need to do. So I'll start off with talking about how I came up with some of the ideas I came up with. I told you I studied African Pan African Studies at uh, Kent State University, and one of the persons I was blessed to meet when I was there is a gentleman by the name of Maulana Correa. He is the creator of Kwanzaa, the African American holiday that some of you all might be familiar with. And he created Kwanzaa because he thought that the cultural traditions that uh, this American population had 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 been torn from them on the transport on the in the existence in the in their reality here in America and they had no cultural traditions to hang on to they didn't know who they were they didn't know how to identify themselves as a community and so they needed to create one they needed to create some sense some semblance of culture and he came up with the seven principles of Kwanzaa and the seven days of Kwanzaa and the meaning for all the days but before he did that he started thinking about ancient African wisdom and philosophy. And he found this phrase in Swahili. The phrase is kawaida. And kawaida means, quite frankly, the tradition. It means the way. It means the habit. It means how we do what we do. And I thought to myself, wow, isn't that wonderful? Don't we all need habits and traditions? Don't we all need to identify with something that makes us special, that makes us unique. So I built everything I built around the theory that we need habits, we need tradition, we need principles, we need ideas about how we need to do what we need to do. And I created a program called True Voice. If you look on your sheet there, by the bottom left hand corner, um, I want you to circle True Voice. T R U. You don't have to do this, Kate. It's going to be, <laughs> to be there. Uh, if you know what you're doing, I'm sorry. Um, True Voice is a process. It's an acronym. And when I created True Voice, I created it as a questionnaire. And I use this tool to help other professionals get to know other professionals. So it's 16 questions. That if you ask these 16 questions, you'll have an idea about someone else's Real voice, what is their unique message? What is their unique stamp? What, is, what are they trying to deliver to the universe? So I want you to imagine somebody interviews you and they talk to you for 20 or 30 minutes and they never say a word about themselves. All they do is ask you the most engaging questions you've ever had asked to you in your entire life in one setting and listen to your answers. And the only goal is to understand you. Now what do you think happens? How do you think you might feel about this person that's asking you these questions? You can speak. <laughs> You're gonna love them. You're gonna love them? Why? Because they gave me the chance to talk about me. Exactly. Any other thoughts? How are, how are you going to feel about them? Any, any, any other ideas? Trust. You're going to trust them? Maybe. All right, you'll start that process. Yes, what else? Well, I come from the opposite end. I'm the one who's doing the questioning. Right. And people are saying, you're interviewing me. You're not engaging me. Right. So, so it's it's a negative when I hear that. I understand that. And I'm, I'm, I know why that, why that exists, too. We can fix that one. Any, any other thoughts about that? Relationship, you're developing a relationship it's the beginning of developing a relationship yes okay so let me tell you what people have said and I've done 987 true voice interviews over the last 15 years since I've developed this process and yes there have been people who felt interrogated or that I was writing a book right you know, that's okay. and, and you know how I fixed this process this problem I told my friend truly 
All I want to do is get to understand you. And when I get to understand you, I may have some idea of where we could go in relationship to one another. And I may be able to be conversant with you about what that might look like that might be meaningful to you. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you to just let your guard down and be open to the process. You know what happens all the time? They might be a little skeptical, but they go, go ahead. And then when we finish, they're like, oh my God, this is the greatest conversation I've ever had. This is the most meaningful thing that's ever happened because it's not an interrogation. It's actually an expose and helping them understand themselves and helping them understand, help it. because the information they share, they've never shared with anybody like this ever before. The questions are that magical. Um, that's another thing I'm going to send you guys. We all said, all said and done. But I want to talk to you about true voice and how you can use this tool. Voice is an acronym. It stands for five things. Vision. Objects or obstacles. Instinct or intuition. Commitments. And environment. Vision, obstacles, instinct, commitments, and environment. If you ask people questions about this thing, how do you envision yourself moving forward? If everything was perfect, what would your life look like? What's the most meaningful thing you can see yourself accomplishing in your future? What obstacles are in the way of you accomplishing these things you're talking about? Intuitively, instinctively, what do you know about what you might do to overcome these obstacles? What kind of commitments can you make to yourself, or have you already made to yourself, to attack these obstacles? What kinds of environmental concerns might you have to watch out for? Because there's nothing you can do about it. And there's a whole bunch of information about those key ideas and how you use those key ideas. What do you think I discovered somewhere around interview number 327 or so? Commonality, a lot of commonality. Yeah. But what I really discovered was if I did this interview myself, for myself, I would have the words to articulate to someone else who I am, what I'm all about, why I'm all about what I'm all about, what it means to me to be me, and I can answer the questions that were posed in Kawaita theory back when I, when I learned from Dr. Karenga, and the three questions were, who are you? Are you really who you say you are? And are you all that you ought to be? Each of us must wrestle with these questions. When we begin to answer those questions, we are left with the language that will allow us to articulate the most meaningful aspects of our lives and ourselves to others. Now, why do you think this is vital in your job search? Let me see if you put the creative hat on. You need to match uh, your strengths with what you, with what the organization is seeking to accomplish. Exactly. To make sure to match. If you're not armed with a well thought through concept or idea about what you really bring to the table, who you really are, how on earth do you expect others to figure it out? I mean, you think they're trying to hire you based on a job description alone? Really? Who thinks that? How many times have you gotten a job based on a job description and found out once you got into the job that that wasn't the job? Anybody ever had that problem, that situation? Because yeah, this is the norm. Because what you can do from an HR perspective 
or from a job perspective, you can never do to really understand each other and people. It's that hidden thing that happens in transaction human to human. When you understand emotionally how we function and how important it is for us to build trust and relationship with each other outside of the capabilities statement, the skills requirement. I, I, I could throw up every time I see a job description and they tell me all the things they want you to have in the job. They want you to have this, and they want you to have that, and they want you to be able to do this, and they want you to be able to do this. And you go, oh, yeah, I can do all that kind of stuff. But I can do so much more. But should I talk about the other stuff? Should I share my other abilities in the job interview, in the process? Should I tell them who I really am? Or are they just interested in these capability statements? So what happens, guys? We check off all the boxes, and we think we did a good job, right? But who gets hired? The person they like got hired. And they like that person not based on any of this stuff. This stuff just got them in the door. It's the other stuff. It's their likability. It's their ability to be transparent. It is the understanding of common values and sharing of common values. So I'm telling you today, what each of you should do is take the True Voice workshop for yourself. Take the True Voice assessment for yourself. And to begin to use that language and how you describe who and what you are and what you're all about. When you talk to others who should be interested in you, because you have talents, and you have gifts, and you have abilities that others should be interested in. And you have to figure out how to meaningfully articulate your gifts. Because when you can meaningfully articulate your gifts, here's what happens. People go, oh, where have you been? Oh, my I need somebody like you. I didn't even know I should, I should create a position for someone like you. I didn't even know you were out there. You get this? This happens quite naturally in human relationships, but we don't understand how it happens. When our eyes meet across the crowded room and we give each other that winning smile and that nod that says, it's okay to come talk to me. That's attraction. It happens in professional settings as well. But it's for different reasons. It's not for the same reasons, but they still like you. They're still interested in you. They still want to talk to you. And you have to understand how all this works in order for you to get the job you want. Not the job you have to take, but the job you want. Now I'm looking around the room, I'm scanning the room, with the exception of maybe one person, none of us should be in a position today where we just have to accept whatever comes along. I mean, we've been there already. We've suffered that route already. It's time to find the opportunities we were designed to have. It's time to get in touch with our real abilities. How much time do we have today? Well, an hour or two, an hour and a half. We started a little bit late, so. Maybe 6.15 or so. Okay. So I got a few more minutes and I want to get through some, some really hardcore information, right? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why am I, why am I talking to you today about this stuff? It's because I know that optimism has been challenged for whatever reason. You know, I can sense it in the room. You know, it's been challenged. Pessimism is creeping in and it's about to swallow us up. Well, we've got to reverse the tide, but we can't reverse the tide if we don't understand it. If we don't understand how it happened, what happened, what it means to us, and how to move forward. So I'm gonna give you some math, okay? Optimism is actually a mathematical formula. 
it requires two things. It requires on one side of the equation, hope, plus confidence equals optimism. You need to have both hope and confidence to get you to optimism. Why should you be optimistic in the first place? Why? I'm listening. What do you think? Because you believe something is possible, the more intention to get it. <laughs> you might, you might, you might have more intention to get it. Why else might you be opt optimistic? Ah, because you're ultimately in control of your fate. What happens to you? Sense of control. Yeah. For yourself. Why else might you be optimistic? Just the the fact that you believe that you can do it allows you to have the strength to try and be able to do it. Right. Optimism attracts other people. It attracts other people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something, and don't let anybody know I told you that. This. Even though this is being this is on Facebook Live. Yep. <laughs> don't let don't don't let you people on Facebook either. Don't let anybody know I told you this. <laughs> If you're not optimistic, you're done. Because you have no hope. You have no confidence. You cannot move. It will paralyze you. The fear, the paranoia, the, you know, oh my God, this happened to me. I can't get over it or pass it around it. It will make you regress into a childhood in nature. And I promise you, nobody wants to hang out with you. Because you're a party pooper. <laughs> you're no fun. So now, how do you get it back? And I'll give you another reason. Um, Marshall Goldsmith, in his book, The Mojo Quadrant, describes mojo as the ability to lose yourself in something so thoroughly and so formidably that time just passes by and you're having so much fun, you're having so much enjoyment that it doesn't, nothing even matters to you anymore except what you're doing and what you're engaged in. That's mojo. I will submit to you it's impossible to have a mojo moment if you don't have optimism. If you don't have hope, if you don't have confidence, you're not going to dig in deep. You're not going to do your best work. You're not going to disappear into it. You're going to be worried the whole time. Oh, the shoe's about to fall. Something negative is about to happen. There's some more drama. I know, I keep oh, wait till this goes wrong. Wait, wait till this blows up in my face. It's not going to work that way. You've got to have optimism. So how do you manufacture it? If I can give you the secrets, the tools to just create optimism out of nothing, would that be exciting to you? Oh, you poor people. <laughs> poor people. So I, I told you I was going to give you some math, right? A part of optimism is understanding its relationship to greatness. Optimism is needed, necessary for resilience to happen. Greatness cannot happen without resilience. So let's talk about resilience for a second. What do we think resilience is? Ability to bounce back. Uh, that's the ability to keep, that, that's, that's, that's ability to overcome a challenge, but it requires resilience in order for you to overcome a challenge. But resilience is what happens before you overcome the challenge, right? It's that I'm going to keep at it. I'm not going to give up, right? I'm going to keep going. In spite of the challenge, in spite of the obstacle, I'm going to keep moving forward. Resilience requires strength and flexibility. You don't have those two things, you can't be resilient. You got to be open to new stuff, new challenges, new opportunities, and you got to be strong enough. Know that you're strong enough to get up again and try again and move again and move forward again. But without optimism, can you be resilient? Impossible. 
that math don't work, that dog don't hunt. So let's figure out how you can be optimistic. What's the science behind this thing? What's the math behind this thing? How do you make it work? And we find, studies show, optimism, we said, is all about hope. It's about confidence. But can you manufacture hope, belief, faith? Can you create it? Yeah. How? Hmm? Your outlook. Outlook, yeah. Attitude. Attitude's going to create hope. Mindset. Mindset's going to create hope. Taking risk. Taking action. 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 It's the magic tool to create hope. Sometimes you don't know what to do, but you just start doing something. And you figure out, you know what? I can do this. I'm good at this. What if I keep going? And then all of a sudden you're on a path. And every path has a destiny. And every destiny is simple vision that guides you to a different place. So you gotta think about it. Well, we find that hope is made up of three things. It's made of possibility, it's made up of anticipation, and it's made up of, can you read my own writing? Me and I didn't bring my reading glasses to shame. <laughs> no, because it's not, you can't read it either. <laughs> <laughs> the great box. What's in the great soda? I really want this. What's the big word up top? Desire. See, I told you you couldn't read it either. <laughs> Anybody got good eyes around here? I know, we all got glasses, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. I can use my phone and zoom out. Yeah, that might that might work too. Which one? The gray box. The gray circle. Desire. Desire. Thank you. I really want this. That makes sense. Okay. So you need desire, you need possibility, and you need anticipation. It literally gets you the hope. You gotta want it. You gotta be anticipating it. And you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to get there. Possibility it has to be something that's, that, that's possible for you. Now, crazy thing about hope. Can't prove it. Can't. It's blind faith. But it's not blind, is it? If there's real possibility. If you want it, if there's a desire for it. And if you're anticipating it. On the other side of that equation is confidence. Confidence requires sureness. It requires conviction. And I've got to get a better printer because I have the same problem. Oh, there it is. Intimacy. <laughs> confidence requires sureness, conviction, and intimacy. Here's what I'm talking about. You have to know. Sure. I know I know, and I know I know, in order for there to be confidence. You also have to be really close to it. It's got to be part of you to really know it. That means it's intimate. You're close to it in order for you to have confidence. Right? And then it's got to be conviction. So much conviction that you say stuff like, I stand for this. If you have those things, those six ideas, possibility, desire, anticipation, sureness, conviction, intimacy, well, those are the conditions that you need for optimism. Without those six ideas, you got something a little less. Optimism is waning. Now, there's no such thing as pure optimism. It really isn't. It's on a continuum. And it's on a continuum between idealistic ideas, where the hope is, and pragmatic ideas, where the confidence is. And you, you may bounce back and forth, but you need all six of the components to get to optimism. When you do this well, when you understand how to use this well, there's a couple facts that have become reality. Optimism has a multiplier effect. The more optimistic you, be, you are, 
the more you show and share your optimism. The more you infect other people around you with your optimism. People start going, yeah, I'm with you. I believe in you. I have faith in you. Yes, you can. You have the confidence. I, I know you do. Let's do it. Can I, can I help? Can I get on board? Does that happen with pessimism? People go, people run to you. They run away. <clears throat> they run away. Right? You don't want that. Number two, optimism, because it requires hope, is one of those things. It's necessary. You can't do it without hope. You gotta have it. It inspires strength. Optimism will make you get up and work out. Optimism will make you stretch. It'll make you grow. It'll force you to behave in a way that's going to move you forward. You can't, you can't not move forward when you have optimism. So you have to focus on that. It's going to create more and more confidence in you. It's going to affirm the best in you from within. It's going to nurture your soul. And last, it's going to heal your heart and your mind. If you don't have optimism, you're poor damaged. So you may need some help. But the key to getting the help is to understand what the missing links are, what the missing pieces are. Because people who are optimistic, they always think these things. They always think that they're at the best. They're the best that they can be right now. They're doing the best they can. Things are the best they should be right now. That's how they think. They always think things are getting better. Optimistic people are hopeful people. They're thinking things are getting better. And last, they believe that the good will win over evil. That's optimism. Now, if you don't think that being right is a good thing, and being right or righteous to your values will help you win, just give up. Don't go vote. Don't, 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 don't leave the house. You know, because you're, you're done. Think about it. If you're not giving your best, you're not having good, you need to get in touch with, with the optimistic Inner, 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 inner thoughts and inner being. So what does all this have to do with networking? And what does it all have to do with your job? I'm going to suggest a couple things for you today. Exercises you should do. Write your perfect job description. Whatever it is. If, you, if it was the perfect opportunity for you, what would it look like? I want you to start to envision your commute to the perfect job. I want you to think about waking up with the most energy you've ever had. Just the right cup of coffee. Just the right outfit. And the right perfume or cologne. And that wonderful hug or kiss goodbye by your loved one. And that getting in the car or taking the train or the bus and having the most beautiful ride into your perfect job. And I want you to get to that job and imagine your colleagues so happy to see you. Good to see you. We're going to have a great day today. This is going to be magical. Today is going to be a magical day. I can't wait for our team meeting. Oh my God. Wait till I share with you what I've been doing over the weekend to move our project forward or something like that. Then I want you to imagine the higher ups going if it wasn't for you. This company would be in a hurtful place. But because you bring so much to us we're glad to have you here. We can't wait to celebrate your 30th anniversary with us. <laughs> Write that job description. 
What's it going to look like when you have that job? What's it going to feel like to have that job? What are you going to be able to be, do, or have at that moment? Write it all down. Describe it. Write it so clearly that you understand and will not tolerate not having it. Because your optimism will be at an all-time high. You will be able to envision the possibility and walk in it and take nothing less. Because if you don't, you're selling. Anything less is selling. And it's okay to settle if you've made that agreement with yourself that I'm going to settle. It's not okay to settle and be surprised <laughs> that you don't have what you want because you didn't think it all the way through. Because when you negotiate, well, you know, I don't, I can't, you, you, I can't have eight weeks vacation. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll be happy with six. I can't have a full benefit package? Okay, all right, fine, fine. I'll do without the 401k. But if you don't think about where you want to go, about what you want to be, about what you can deliver, or what you can stand on, and what you can bring to the table, how on earth do you hope to get it? In fact, what you hope is not to get it. And you're not performing to the best of your ability. And you're not taking your talents to where they can go. And with that, I bid you adieu. <laughs> so, I got time for a few questions before they kick me out, I'm sure. <laughs> nah, it's okay. Good. Okay. What if you already had that? Had what? A perfect job. You can get it. And you again. had it for over 20 years, mm -hmm. and they even created a position. Yes. Yeah. You had all that. You can make another one. You did it once, you do, you do it evidence that you can do it again. Whether you want to or not, that's a whole different ballgame. But you can. And you know you can. And there's nobody that can rob you of that. I say, let your freak flag fly. <laughs> You know, um, because those are things that you know we all get kicked, we all get beat up, and we all get torn away from something we love. It's just an opportunity for something new. One of the things I often tell crowds when I'm talking to them is, in order to have a break, sometimes you have to have a break with. You gotta let go to grab something new. It's scary. But the reality is, having the strength to let it go gives you the openness you need to embrace the new. Crazy thing how that works that way. It just does. I can't explain it. I wish I could. It's just the way the universe works. Any other questions? Yes. In the back. So not all of us have your wonderful, outgoing personality. Um, I was wondering if you had any suggestions for folks who are going to networking events or maybe just meeting with somebody, trying to meet with somebody um, that's in their industry that maybe isn't more introverted? As an introvert myself, I'm well rehearsed and well practiced in the procedure of making people fall in love with me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how I do it? I take great interest in them. And then they take great interest in me. And the greatest gift we could give any other person on the planet is the gift of our attention. If you pay attention, people are like flowers that need water. Attention is the water. It's the fertilizer. It's the sunlight. It's everything they need. And all of a sudden, you watch them bloom because no one pays attention to them. Everybody walks by them all day long, every day. It doesn't matter what position they have, no matter what title they have, and even those who are stars, they get fake attention paid to them. They get people coming to them, oh, I want to be, oh, I'm thinking about, oh, you're so wonderful, and that's great, 
But it only lasts until they're on, when they're on stage and when they're in the home, in the quiet space. Where is that love? Where is that attention? It's the person who gives it to them then that gets the best from them. So you gotta think about that. You see somebody that who has produced some great content. Maybe you read it online and you see it on social media and you go, I'm gonna hit the like button. Is that the best you could do? Think about it. Tell them why you liked it. Post it in the comment box. Oh my God, this is gonna change my life. I'm planning on doing this with this information. Would you mind if I share this with my friends? What do you think is gonna happen? Yeah. Somebody's gonna go, no. I don't want you to share it. No. I put it out there because I want you to keep it to yourself. Really? If you do this, people who should fall in love with you are going to begin to pay attention to you. They're going to look at your profile. They're going to look at your Facebook page. They're going to look at your stuff. And they're going to go, this is a fascinating person. I got to know more. They may even post a comment to you and give you a question. Now you're in a relationship. I don't know how it happened. It happened because you had interest. <laughs> you get this? What else? Any other questions? One more? Go ahead. Can I follow up? Yes. And hopefully this applies to other people who have had the same issue. Um, and I'm seeing this not so much as a, partly as a business owner. Mm -hmm. um, you might be able to appreciate this. Is it getting uh, meetings with people or even just getting them to respond to an email? And this is also with jobs as well, like sometimes you want to meet with somebody just to kind of see who they know and you're not asking them for a job. And it's like, yeah, I'm not comfortable becoming a stalker, but it's like, are people really that freaking busy or is it? <laughs> so there's three things I got to tell you really quickly. One, email is the easiest thing in the world to ignore. Yeah, I, yeah. Even if it's ignored unintentionally, it is the easiest thing to ignore because it's going to fall down to the bottom of the email box and it goes into oblivion. Mm -hmm. And even if someone's best intention was to kick back with you and say something to you, they were going through 400 emails today, I may get 600 sometimes in a day. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I don't know, I'm gonna pay attention to it today. But so that, 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 you shouldn't blame them for ignoring your email because it's not like it used to be. Right. But the thing I wanna remind you is we become immune to all messages over time. It doesn't matter what the message is or how it's delivered. Whether it's fax. Remember the fax machine used to go off and get excited? Ooh, we got fax. Oh, oh, AOL come out. Ooh, you've got mail. We get excited. We're, oh, the phone rang. you got to answer it because it rang. No, you know. <laughs> it's all disturbance now. And it will, we, we, we become immune to those disturbances. So you think people are ignoring you. They're not really ignoring you. It's just they become immune to your request or your idea or the, what mode of communication you have. Right? So you have to practice engagement more. The last thing I want to tell you is stop asking for fourth base on the first date. <laughs> if you want to have coffee with somebody, how about a five minute conversation first? How about something small they can easily say yes to? Do that. If you meet them personally, start the engagement process right then. Don't wait till afterwards to go, oh, oh, I'm gonna follow up with you via email or phone call or leave you, because now you're in the phone tree. I mean, I'm not gonna pay attention to that. Only reason I told you guys to do what you did today, because that's, I know, I promised myself I will pay attention to it. And that means I'm gonna go back and look at my text messages from about the hours of five until eight tonight, and those people who texted me with their face, like I promised, like I told them, they're gonna get everything I promised them. Those who didn't, they get nothing. Because I got no time. But we will break that engagement process. And you need to start telling people how to engage with you. We don't do that. We give people our business cards which we, with, the, with the dummy email on it that we plan to ignore. How's that going to work? But you expect them, them to respond to you. You understand? So you got to give it like you want it. If, if, you, if you say to somebody, listen, I want to do something for you, I want to do something with you, would, would it be okay if I contact you? What's the best way to contact you? Are you sure it's okay? Ask, ask several times. Get permission to disturb somebody. They're more likely to pay attention to you after you've gotten permission. That's Seth Godin. Mm -hmm. Get permission. If you got permission, then you can, you can disturb me all day long. 
I'll tell people all the time, you gonna, you gonna hold me accountable for something I promised you? Yes, do it. Other than that, sorry. Sometimes I make a mistake. I gotta move on. Make sense? I got room for one more question? Sure. One more question. All right, most happy guys, sir. What one takeaway would you like us to take from your handout? <sighs> there's a lot there. Um, and the takeaway is there's an art and science to this thing we call relationship building. It is not mystery and magic. You have to get good at the fundamentals, and the fundamentals are in the science. And you have to get good at the art. And the, 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 the process of the art is in there as well. But if you do this well, you're going to learn and you're going to grow. And people are going to fall in love with you. It doesn't matter what your size is, what your race is, what your ethnic orientation is, whatever sexual orientation is. None of that's going to matter. What's going to matter is that you're engaged, you're interested, and you are interested. You have something to deliver, that you know how to articulate what you have to give. If you can't figure any of that stuff out, we're dead, you're dead. And by the way, you get my phone number, so you have any questions, you got no more excuses. Because <laughs> I know how to do this. All right? I don't like doing it because I'm not a people person. <laughs> I'm an introvert. I really mean that. But I'm a well-rehearsed, well-practiced, and thoroughly thought through introvert. And that makes all the difference in the world. Because I know what I know. And Coach Powell, you can practice on us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>